Patrick Ewing obviously was the big player and everything was centered around him, much like Steph Curry is, but Patrick was never going to give you, you know, the juiciest stuff. The best thing he ever gave us was when the Knicks were talking to Phil Jackson and Jeff Van Gundy and Ewing were really tight. So the Knicks were making that finals run in 99. So afterwards, Mike Wise and myself, and this tells you how much the media has changed. We wait, we're waiting, we're waiting. Everyone leaves the locker room. Patrick, who always would talk right after a game, then go take a shower. Then he'd be walking around that really, that blue terry cloth robe that he would wear. <laughs> and he would look at us, what the hell you want? Like he was friendly with us at this point. And we said, have you seen the story? Have you heard that the Knicks are talking to Phil Jackson? Like, what are you talking about? I said, well, they're talking to Phil Jackson about being a coach. He said, go tell Phil Jackson to take his ass back to Chicago. We don't want him here. Now, mm. in the in the era of social media, we might have. Oh now, God. this is after a playoff game. We ended up holding that story for a day as like mm. the follow in the off day story because, you know, it's the access wasn't that great. But you were able to do stuff like that on uh, if you before Twitter, so to speak. Yeah. You, you well, I heard the job. I heard the job was just so much better before Twitter. I remember I was talking to Brian Windhorst years ago about this, how. You would have one of these off days and you would spend some of it maybe bullshitting in your hotel, calling different people, filling your notebook. And there was a pace of life that was somewhat manageable and the speed and the information inundation, it really changed the job itself for the worse. I know some people listening go, I don't, why do I care about how happy you uh, miserable fucks are? And I, I understand that, but I, yeah. I found that so interesting that I had just missed the boat, that there had been a time before I arrived on the scene where this job was beyond seeming cool to somebody at a wedding was actually really cool to do. Yeah, so there was a year, Isaiah Thomas joins the Knicks, and right before the break, he trades Keith Van Horn. Keith Van Horn is being represented by um, uh, David Falk, who was Michael Jordan's agent. Obviously, Isaiah Thomas, Michael Jordan, we all know about their history. The All-Star game happens out in L.A. I look to my left, I see David Falk standing there. Now, David Falk, when, Pat, when he was Ewing's agent, you could never get to the guy. You, you know, He would return mm -hmm. maybe your call and say, just return your call, but I'm, I really can't talk to you. So this will be your only call for the year. Click. That's basically what the relationship was like. I see now Ewing's no longer on the team. David Falk, you know, Michael Jordan's out of the league. David Falk's not as powerful probably as he was. So now he's more accessible to the media. I see him at the All-Star game. I asked him about Keith Van Horn. And he starts kind of complaining about the trade. I said, do you think Dikembe will be traded? He says, oh, no, no. I already told Dikembe. Isaiah Thomas is going to trade you. He's going to try to get rid of every guy that I represent because he doesn't like Michael Jordan. I'm standing mm. there with my recorder. I'm saying, I could use this. He goes, yeah, I don't care. He then proceeds to destroy Isaiah Thomas. And I'm thinking, this is an unbelievable story. I didn't write it that day, the day of the All-Star game. I wrote it on the plane ride back to New York, and then it ran in Tuesday's paper. You know, because back, obviously, there weren't, um, I didn't have to put it up on social media or the internet. And when Isaiah Thomas saw me at the Nick game, I think it was the Wednesday, might have been the first game after the All-Star break, he, he was blaming me. He was like, why would you mm. give this guy a form to say that? I said, Isaiah, I asked him, he has clients on the team, and he's saying that they're going to get traded because you you don't like his clients. I, you know, mm. But that's a kind of a point of, I didn't in that moment have to write it, and you could, especially if you got it alone, you could save it for a day, yeah. believe it or not. Well, I don't know if that story would happen now because – People are so sensitive about the agencies. I, I mean, this is obviously a topic I cover a lot, which is that there's the MBA that's told to people and there's the behind the scenes MBA. And it's a it's it's different. Things happen for odd reasons. I mean, do you have any do you have any broad thoughts on the Knicks and let's say, I don't know, a little agency shop called CAA? Yeah. And do you think that's a story that has been reported enough? Do you think it's overblown? What, what do you think of where we're at right now, where the agencies are such a part of how reporters break news, and therefore the reporters sometimes edit them out of stories that they're highly involved in? Yeah. Well, I also think, all right, so for the Knicks, and I knew Leon Rose really well, because uh, Rick Brunson, Jalen Brunson's father, I covered him on the Knicks, and I ended up developing a close relationship with them. As you know, you tend a lot of times to develop closer relationships with the guys at the end of the roster. They're usually the most available. You're sitting around talking. So I became close with 
Rick Brunson, who was friends with Leon Rose. That was, that was Leon's first ever client. So because of Rick, that's how I got to know Leon Rose. And I would talk to Leon Rose all the time. The problem with Leon Rose is Leon Rose doesn't tell you anything. So mm -hmm. did he, did, was he helpful during the whole LeBron James thing with the Miami Heat and the New York Knicks? To a certain degree, he was, but he never said, hey, this is what we're doing. You know, LeBron might do yeah. this. Leon was a good guy. He was nice. But Leon kind of, I always felt, kept everything pretty close to the vest. But I think the New York media, in terms of CAA, has done a pretty good job because, you know, Tom Thibodeau is represented by CAA. He's the head coach. You got Leon Rose, who used to be the agent there. There's a bunch of players that are CAA guys. But, you know, I, we all were making fun of it, calling the Kentucky CAA Knicks because it felt like every guy on the team hmm. was from Kentucky and CAA. But that's that's obviously changed a little bit. But listen, I you know, when I was a beat reporter, you needed to know some agents and knowing the agents help you kind of understand the dynamic of a locker room and how many stories. Everyone thinks that a lot of times you get a story from the GM of the team tells you what's going on. A lot of times it's the second agent of the third least important player on yeah. the team who kind of knows what's going on inside the locker room. So the relationship, I think the relationship between the agents and the media is going has been going on for a long time. Well, to what you're saying, it's why these agencies are representing a wider array of people behind the scenes. And you'll see somebody who might be making 90 grand a year as a back of the bench assistant coach, and they're represented yeah. by CAA or whatever other agency. Now, what's the reason for that? These agencies don't want a cut of their salary. It's worth nothing to them. And it's not even that they think these guys are going to get promoted and become the next Eric Spolstra, though maybe it could happen. No, it's that their eyes and ears on the ground and yeah. information is valuable. If they know something from the locker room that they could use, say maybe a player is dissatisfied with his agency yeah. and he could maybe be poached it's valuable to have these guys on the ground who can run that information back to yeah. you. And a lot of the NBA behind the scenes is a little bit like the CIA. And it's just, uh, I mean, I miss some of the, uh, the skullduggery uh, that I was around back in the day. Now I hear about it in phone calls, but as we were talking about, it's just another thing when you're actually yeah. on the scene.